so indeed, uh, today we'll be focusing on uh, infrasounds and how we can uh, use this technology to uh, mitigate the impact of uh, explosive volcanic events uh, with a focus in the uh, in the region. Uh, so this this is done. It's not only my work, obviously. Uh, we have reached this stage of uh, building. Uh, a, a well-known group of infrasounds uh, with uh, with an incredible team and with collaborations across uh, schools. Uh, Fidel mentioned the collaboration with uh, ADM. Uh, the instruments that we use are installed and maintained by the Center of Geohazard Observations, uh, and the research that we're doing would not be possible without their their support. So thanks thanks to uh, the entire team. This region is quite uh, it's quite uh, special when you study infrasounds. Why? Because it actually saw the birth of this uh, technology. Uh, imagine you there on a boat, early morning, August 1883. You have these beautiful volcanoes in the background, and boom, the thing just exploded. And this explosions and collapse actually produced the loudest sound ever recorded on Earth. The sound itself, the one you can hear, was actually heard more than 3,000 kilometers away from the source, all the way to Mauritius. That is the sound you can hear. The sound was broader spectrum going all the way down in frequencies low sound like this and this pressure wave was recorded all the way to Europe not only once but two times so it was one of the loudest most energetic sound ever recorded and this is uh in you know backyards this is in, in Krakato volcano and um and Anna recently published a paper on the recent eruptions of Anak Krakato the child of Krakato so it's quite a special place uh, to study infrasound there's a lot of things going on and I'd like to uh, capture your attentions on one thing it's quite challenging to listen to one source in this case, we have a source, which is a speaker in a similar room, and we have to concentrate on what this person is doing. Though there is background noise, there is people drinking coffee on the outside, there's people whispering inside, maybe some of them are snoring, hopefully nobody's snoring yet, and still you want to concentrate on the speaker. To do that, you can equip yourself with specific equipment and look at the speaker and kind of filter everything from outside. And then you can nicely extract the sound from this source and study it. If I put it back into the context of webinar, the situation is the same. Uh, you may have cats, dogs, constrictions, someone eating chips next to you. And what you want to do is uh, listen to this uh, city guy in the background trying to explain what is infrasound. Take home from those first few slides, you want to be able to extract information from a given source. This is not new, um, and, uh, and we have to deal with um, some limitations that we have as, as human. Uh, you can see this is a, this is a diagram that uh, Anna uh, likes a lot. Uh, on the x-axis, you have the sound frequency. On the y-axis, you have uh, electromagnetic spectrum, including light. And this little rainbow is what us human can hear and see. And it's quite limiting. It's quite limiting. This is the sound from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. On the higher end of this spectrum, higher frequency, we have ultrasound above 20 kilohertz. And I'd like to highlight this to Perrine, that ultrasound is higher frequency, while infrasound is lower frequencies, below what uh, a human can hear. So since we have these own limitations in our own body, uh, humans were quite inventive trying to expands their sensors away from the heads to be able to be more sensitive to lower frequencies. And when this person was rotating his head, when he could hear the sound in both ears, it means that a boat or an aircraft was coming from this direction. 
this was just giving you an overall directions. And with four such of sensors, you can actually have the uh, elevations as well. So infrasounds has been um, tracked for many, many years. And the technology we're using today derived from this uh, use. Of course, instruments and the technology evolved. Uh, the technology has been used to make sure nobody is testing nuclear um, uh, weapons uh, on the, um, in, in contact with the atmosphere. And uh, we use same as us. We have two here. We use multiple sensors. Here you have uh, eight sensors put together. Here uh, we have uh, seven of those sensors put together. And by combining the informations from all of those individual sensors as an array analysis, we can identify coherent signal coming from a given direction. And you have here a beautiful example of a pulse arriving at different time at different sensors of the same array. And during some analysis, we can extract the directions, the back azimuth uh, of, this, of this signal. This is uh, two examples of designs for arrays. Uh, there is such arrays all around the globe. Uh, you can see those, those uh, magenta, pinkish uh, diamonds uh, all over the place. Uh, each of them is, um, is a site for an infrasound array. And uh, I will be uh, concentrating in this region. You see there's a few official uh, infrasound array and we have uh, installed one in Singapore. So I've been talking about kind of the military view of the infrasound, tracking aircraft, boats, nuclear explosions or chemical explosions, but there's a, um, a broad range of uh, phenomenon that would produce infrasound. Uh, just to name a few or to show uh, a few, we have uh, uh, bolides entering the atmosphere, we have tsunami, big waves or surf, volcanic eruptions and hurricanes. Today we'll be concentrating on the volcanic eruptions. Uh, and if we have uh, time at the end, I will um, uh, play some sounds from um, a tsunami and a volcanic eruption. Those are the source. Uh, this pressure wave needs to then propagate in a complex medium. You have in those set of pictures, uh, the atmosphere, and that's where the infrasound will be propagating. The atmosphere is ever changing. There's winds, there's temperature, there's humidity. And depending on where the source is compared to where the sensor or the array is, you will have um, a better chance or not to detect or record this event. If you're working in the uh, in the forest on the trees in the in the tree and there is a, a storm and a lot of winds like yesterday in Singapore, uh, if you call someone upwind or downwind, you will have to push your voice more or less. So, you know, if if we if we use this simple idea and uh, do it at a much bigger scale, we have those kind of maps uh, produced by Dorian in which the color represents the minimum acoustic pressure needed in order to be recorded by at least one station. So blue color, you are upwind, you have a sound that is going with the winds to other station, you don't need a huge amount of sound. If you are upwind and the sound needs, the infrasound needs to propagate against the winds, you need a higher atmospheric pressure. And this is for one day. You can do that for multiple days. Uh, here we have nine years of data. At the bottom, uh, we selected one region in Sumatra, one region in the Philippines. And you can see the minimum acoustic pressure needed through times in order to be recorded by one station. And I'm showing you that so you can see the impact of having a stations in Singapore. So if you concentrate on the map, if you look here, now we have this nice blue patch here. That's the impact of adding a station in Singapore. These stations will allow us to drastically reduce the acoustic pressure needed at a volcano in order to be recorded, especially in Sumatra, 
but we can see there's, depending on the seasons, there's a bit of a, an impact and improvements in the Philippines. One way to look at these improvements is through this improvement factor, which is the ratio between the minimum acoustic pressure from the IMS stations only, normalized or divided by um, IMS plus Singapore. And for Sumatra, we can see here that 40% of the time, the uh, minimum acoustic pressure uh, needed is improved by a factor of at least three. For the Philippines, it's a bit further away. 20% of the time, we have an improvement of 1.2. Regardless of those values, it is an improvement and a drastic improvement for Sumatra. So, you know, I've been talking about these, these stations in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is a small, relatively small country. It's 40 by 20 kilometers, give or take. And it's quite hard to find a nice, quiet place to install an infrasound station. We managed to find a good place, which is, for those uh, who've been there, would uh, recognize the shape of this lake, is the Macritchie Reservoir. We have five of those sensors. And those five sensors together formed the uh, Singapore array. Similar type of installations at the um, IMS uh, stations. And uh, the team went um, to the field uh, just last week. And you can see here the type of conditions you have when you do field work in, uh, in Singapore. Some of those stations are installed in places that are uh, closed, not open to the public. And uh, it's a nice conversion with uh, PUB and NPARC in order to have access uh, to those remote uh, sites. So if you really want to visit the sites and you can carry 30, 33 kilo batteries, I guess you are more than welcome to uh, apply and join the queue uh, to go to the field. So what is our ability to detect uh, an event? We have on this uh, graph, the frequency contents and here the acoustic power or the power of the, uh, the signal within this frequency band. There's two things. Uh, there's the macrobarom, which is a non-linear interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is um, uh, ever present and generates uh, infrasound in the, re the, 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 um, the frequency band of 0.1 to 0.3 uh, Hertz. Above the uh, eight Earth, we can see uh, um, an increase of uh, acoustic energy, and that's anthropogenic. You can see five, or maybe you can't see it, but it's, there's five curves here, five sensors. Again, just like we look right or left when someone is speaking with those five sensors, we can extract a direction, an azimuth of the source. And we can extract these directions per frequency. The red-ish color is low frequency corresponds to the macro barom. And the blue color, higher frequencies, corresponds to very fixed in positions, narrow bands, blue patches here in a clear designed or distinct azimuth. We had an undergrad that did a project to locate this source. It's around the Orchard region. It's kind of out of today's topic. We will concentrate on the macro barom. And if I represent this on a map, this is what we have. It might look bad because what we're seeing here, it's showing us that there is a lot of noise, microbarom noise coming from directions of interest. Because in these directions, we have a large part of the volcanoes uh, from Sumatra. Fret not, uh, if I look at the uh, azimuth uh, and the amount of time we have uh, Microbarum. This is for an average uh, year. We can look through uh, through different months, and we see that April and May are uh, quite noisy in these directions. But most of the time, we will be able to have detections from those volcanoes in in um, in Sumatra. Uh, in order to have those detections, it has to be loud enough, and the louder, the bigger. Uh, so if you are not um, verse into uh, volcano thermology. Uh, terminology, we have what we called a volcanic explosivity index, uh, which range from uh, zero to eight, zero being a small volume, low explosivity, and eight being a gigantic 
uh, explosions that would impact uh, the full uh, humanity. Uh, in terms of uh, plume heights, uh, VI3 will range between 5 and 15. And if you increase the VI, you increase the uh, height at which you can inject volcanic material. On the side, you have here different flight levels. Um, when you were able to travel and when you will be able to travel, this is a typical flight height, 11-ish kilometer. So see that a VI3 and above will be impacting those flight level. What is the likelihood to have such an event? Uh, that is a study that is done by uh, was done by Patrick Woolley, but the uh, Sudan's group is um, is uh, pushing this uh, uh, much further uh, using new data. So I invite you to to uh, to talk to them for updated uh, information. What we see here, the red line, is what is the likelihood of getting an event within the next ten years. And you can see that for the region, it's almost certain, extremely high probability to have VI3 and 4s in 10 years. A VI5 and 6 is well above 10%. So yes, it does matter to look and being able to identify those massive events. Can Infrasound do that? Well, uh, from the Brova et al 2012, we can see that Yes, infrasound can detect volcanic events. We have here the plume height above the summit, um, functions of the distance from the volcano. Uh, in uh, black, we have the most distant detection. Uh, the red cross is the event is not detected. And um, the open circles is a detection, but there's a detection that is further away. And I give you here a range of plume height for different uh, VEIs. The good news when you look at this is Anything below 1,600 kilometers is detected. And that's, that's the good news. So if we uh, put that on a map again, what we have is around those, around those stations, uh, infrasound stations, arrays, we have two circles, a one hour travel time and a 1,600 kilometer radius. And you can see that most of those volcanoes in the region are um, within one hour travel time or within uh, detection range if the eruption is VI3 and, and above, which is the uh, scale of interest. The challenge is for the volcanoes in Java, which turns out to be uh, the most likely to produce those large events. And that's uh, uh, an effort we are putting together uh, with the uh, CGO and the colleagues in Indonesia at the CVGHM is to uh, fill the gap with new instruments. On this map, we can see that in Java, the color is kind of maroon, oops, which is, um, which is a high likelihood of a VI4 in the next 10 years. And if you've been following the news, uh, the recent volcanic events were actually coming from, uh, from Java. So we need to make sure we can improve our ability to detect events from this region. So when the volcano goes boom, yes, it produces infrasound. Yes, we can record it. But there is tremendous impact on the ground. And on this schematic from uh, Susanna Jenkins, uh, we have on the x-axis the distance from the volcano. Uh, on the y-axis, the ash thickness on the ground. Uh, you can see that the thickness decreases with the distance. Nevertheless, we can still have impacts on the ground and in the air at large distances. How do we mitigate this? Well, if we know something is going to happen, we can try to act. We can move the population inside. We can shut down critical infrastructure. We can close the airspace. Uh, in this table, uh, we can highlight a few things. Um, it's, it's from Susanna as well. Uh, for the uh, airports, you see that there's closure of the runway for any amount of ash. And that, that's quite a, a dramatic uh, uh, economical impact on the uh, local community. Uh, for 5.5, 20 millimeters, which uh, does not sound much, but it, it does have a tremendous impact on the, uh, on the community and infrastructures. But if we know how much, when things is going to happen, we can trigger 
actions to mitigate the impact. Um, this uh, can be represented here. Uh, if we know there's an eruption, uh, we know where is this, this eruption, we can characterize this eruption and we look at a given phenomena, in that case, tephra fall, ash fall, we can run some models and extract places, time and thresholds in um, at which those uh, places will be impacted. But for that, they need to know the type of eruptions and the locations. And that now we dive into the, the depth of this, this. If there's one slide you need to you know, extract, it's probably this one. In uh, an, operation, an operational setting, sorry, um, colleagues will run one eruptive scenarios and use it to um, forecast what is likely to happen. This is one eruptive scenarios which don't have to be the one uh, that is the actual eruption. So the operational scenarios can be an underestimate or an overestimate of the actual eruption. Underestimate, you minimize the uh, risk. Overestimate, you uh, are too cautious and you close uh, airspace that is much bigger than uh, what is needed. So as an eruption developed, we need to better characterize the eruption itself. How to get information that we have, and I will be concentrating on infrasound. The source of the infrasound data we can use are from the IMS, from local monitoring if there is, of our research arrays and sensor, such as the one we have in Singapore. And the aim is to reduce the uncertainties on those eruption scenarios to increase the accuracy of a given forecast. In this diagram, that's um, kind of show you the different steps we'll be following. So we have the signal from an eruption. Okay, the eruption is ongoing. We have interaction between the volcano and the atmosphere that will generate infrasound. They would propagate all the way to a, a sensor. They will be detected. From this detection, we can extract some information about the eruption itself. These information can then be injected into simulation. Some time is quite challenging to extract a signal, and I will have just one slide to highlight uh, these collaborations with ADM. Uh, and uh, this research was led by one of our uh, undergrad students at AAC, where uh, he looked at um, uh, power spectral subtractions of noise to enhance a signal. And we can see that depending on the amount of predictions we apply or the, um, the, the time window we use to learn the noise, we can improve this green blob, which is actually the signal. From the uh, default setting to an extreme setting, we drastically improve our ability to detect an event. And that was a cool uh, collaboration with ADM. And I was led by one of our own uh, undergrad students, Anselm. So when we detect the signal, we want to get some physical parameters. The first thing you record at your stations is the amplitude. All right, you have your wiggles, let's go up and down, you get an amplitude of the signal at your sensor. We look at a given at, at a frequency of interest, uh, which is the dominant frequency in that case. This example, sorry, is the Sangian IP 2014 uh, eruption. So we have different stations uh, in the distance. The x-axis will appear uh, in a minute. And here uh, we have the amplitude at the station. Next, we get the amplitude at the source. So we back propagate this energy back to the source. Uh, this is not straightforward. Uh, we can use a simple approach and have an isotropic attenuation, which we know is the limitations, or we can model the actual attenuations between the source and the sensor to have a more accurate um, measurements of the amplitude at the source. From this amplitude at the source, we want to extract the uh, acoustic power at the source. Those numbers are huge, 10 to the 8 watts. What does that mean? Well, good questions. And uh, Anna found a good trick. 
we all heard about these Beirut uh, explosions in August last year. To give you a scale, these uh, explosions was 10 to the 8 watt. So Sanghyai P 2014 was one to two order of magnitude bigger than uh, this explosion. The acoustic power is, is not enough to get parameters for the eruptions. We need to go further. The next step is based on assumptions on the uh, radiative pattern of the energy, we have an exit velocity at the vent. Aha, now I can start to relate to something physical. I have an exit velocity at the vent. OK, that's a good start. Now, if I want to go all the way to the plume height, I need to have an estimate of the flux. And from velocity to flux, I need the dimensions of the vent, which is not always known. And uh, for the magmatic flux, I need to have an estimate of the mass of magma inside. So based on all those hypotheses, either we know them or we have to input a range, we finally have a plume height with associated uncertainties. And from those remote infrasounds, you see all the way to uh, five, 6,000 kilometers, we have a pretty uh, a reasonable estimate of what was retrieved from, uh, from satellites and direct observations. This, um, the source of those uncertainties, sorry. Uh, so, you know, if we want a quick product, we have to assume a distributions of all the key parameters that comes into play. Uh, you have at the bottom, the different type of distributions that Dorian's been using to generate those uh, plume heights uh, for given uh, acoustic amplitudes. And you see that the bigger, player in those uncertainties is actually the radius of the vent. So if we know which volcano and we know the uh, radius of this the vent, the active vent of this volcano, we can slightly improve the uh, distributions. We basically cut off the long tail in the in the distribution. So that's good. We have now ability, we have way to get the plume height, which is an important parameter, from a safe distance with a range of uncertainties. So we, we right there, we improved the single use of one operational scenarios. Can we go further? Well, yes. Uh, there's another example I'd like to share with you is our ability to extract the duration of an intense phase of an eruption from remote infrasound. And I have two examples here. Uh, one example from uh, Corentin Caudron uh, for the Kelut 2014 eruptions, in which we uh, showed that the intense phase of the eruptions lasted for two hours. It was not a simple boom. It was not long lasting like the 2018 eruptions of Anacracato. Uh, which can be uh, seen in, in um, uh, on Asperger uh, paper. In this case, we have coherent, strong signal that is lasting for several days. So you can see the impact that we'll have in the modeling of those infrasound, of those uh, eruptions and the ash dispersal. So to summarize what we can do with the infrasound. Uh, infrasound works days and nights, uh, cloudy or clear, there's no issue there, travel thousands of kilometers. And right now they're used to detect eruptions and try to you know, answer where and when. I hope I convince you that uh, with the use of technology, we can go further than that and use infrasounds to answer how long an eruption is going and here's the example of Kelut that lasted two hours. Uh, and as well, how high the uh, ash plume is going. And that's the example of the uh, Sangin Happy. Uh, there's an, another type of information in this, in this, um, in this figure. Uh, if we look at those uh, green uh, circles with the volcano inside, those are the official VAC reports, uh, Volcanic Ash um, Advisory Center, the issued alerts. And what I'd like to point here is the dashed line are when the information is recorded by an infrasound station. 
and for Kelutz, it's recorded at an infrasound station before uh, the VAC is issued, and same for Sanguian Happy. So let's go back to this um, framework. Now, we know we can do better than just using one operational scenarios. We can, using remote infrasound, better characterize an ongoing eruption. We can always assimilate new informations and refine our knowledge, evolutions of the plume height through times, duration of the eruption. Uh, the source of the infrasounds, uh, I listed it earlier. Um, most of them are publicly available or, um, or we have collaborations or we have uh, installed them ourselves. So take in mind, I don't want to oversell the infrasound. It's a great technology. There's a lot of potentials. I hope I convince you about that, but there is other data available around. There is satellite data, radar data, crowdsourcing, social medias. All of those informations should be considered to further improve our ability to forecast the impact of an eruption. So using all of those data, reduce the uncertainties in the eruption scenarios, which is kind of depicted here. Uh, thanks, Seb, for this drawing. Uh, further increase the accuracy of the forecast, leading at the end to a better ways to mitigate the effect of those eruptions on populations. So if um, um, if through this system, I can tell you, well, in three hours, you are likely to have a millimeter of ash falling on the ground. Well, you can push and make sure most of the aircraft actually take off or you protect them. You have time to um, uh, inform the uh, populations to go inside. You have time to initiate a uh, shutdown of an infrastructure you have time to mitigate the impact. The sooner, the better. Uh, three, uh, the, the, this research that I presented today is uh, based on three recent papers. Um, I give you a bit of time to flash those QR codes. Uh, you can uh, email me or anyone from the team if you want. Uh, and I don't know, Susanna, uh, Mary, or, or do we have still a bit of time? I have a few uh, sounds that I can play. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Definitely. Okay, let's do it. Hmm. So I, I told you earlier, I think I presented this uh, uh, network uh, designed to listen to nuclear events, but we have a lot of natural events as well. So this sound is played, um, is speed up. I, I wish I was in a room and I can look at Perrine and ask what I need to do to listen to it. If you remember, infrasounds are low frequencies. So what we did, the trick we used is we, we compress those infrasounds, we speed them up, and we can hear them. The sound uh, for this event was recorded in Hawaii. And I let you increase the volume of your speakers and listen to it. I replay. I will replay it for those of you who have a nice subwoofer. That's time to, you know, put them on. So we have different different phase that is, you know, that are being recorded uh, by these stations. And this uh, earthquake is not news to anyone. Was major earthquakes, and this uh, image in the middle kind of depicts the fact that uh, the Earth itself uh, was uh, resonating. Uh, the next, uh, the next sound is uh, from Hawaii. Uh, those sound I should mention came from uh, Anna Pertu or uh, Milton Garces. Um, Anna is here and Milton is a colleague in, in Hawaii. So this is the collapse of the Puuhoho uh, uh, crater. Not recent one, uh, an older one, but...
I'll replay this one. Uh, there is different, you, you can hear, right? Some of them are high pitch and some of them are much lower, much deeper. The high pitch one are little rock falls, um, piece of rocks that collapse in the crater. And the deep one, you can visually see it's the full collapse of the floor. So the frequency contents gave us an idea of the size of what is generating the infrasound. Look falls. Boom, the collapse of the full structure. And the last one is uh, also Hawaii. Uh, that was for my for my birthday, so it's always a good video to show uh, different frequency bands, and you will see. Uh, try to jump between those different frequency bands and look at what's happening at the volcano, and try to, you know, appreciate the fact that the low frequency are induced by bigger scale um, phenomena. Decassing, high pitch. Low frequencies where the intensity of those pulses uh, increase. And remotely, um, maybe a bit less um, exciting, uh, but we can still play uh, a sound that was recorded in Singapore uh, from the Kelut eruption in 2014. And uh, there would be quite a lot of noise. And you see when we have this um, blurb of energy, that's when uh, the signal was recorded. And uh, with this, I'm happy to take uh, to take any any questions if you uh, if you have.